from Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians. We've uh, encountered this uh, scripture in the past, but it's a, it's a powerful passage. It's, it's worth reconsidering um, uh, regularly in our lives. <coughs> Paul is, is writing to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is, a, is uh, I think I've said this before, it is a church... Um, it's probably the church community with which Paul has the strongest contentions. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging place for him. Um, they are a challenging lot. Uh, it, it's a very, it is a very diverse community. You know, so when, you, when we hear Paul's words to the Corinthians, you have to have in your mind's eye a community that's made up of Jews and Gentiles, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, the Jewish Christians would have been very prim and proper. Um, the women, particularly Jewish women, Christ, uh, Jewish Christian women, um, would have um, been dressed with head coverings, their traditional Jewish head coverings, and, and very proper. And uh, some of these Greek um, Gentile Christian women, um, they came from very different background, and here they are being thrown into the mix together. Of a worshiping community, uh, and um, there would be rich and poor. Um, there were people who would have been slaves and servants in Corinth, worshiping alongside of aristocratic, um, wealthy, um, freeborn um, Gentiles, uh, and they these two groups would not have mixed socially or worshipped together. And so you have in this Corinthian community an incredible diversity um, that poses its own challenges, and it shows up in Paul's letters. And uh, uh, there is along um, within this diversity a diversity of lifestyles. Again, some of the some of the folks probably who are part of this community, it could be that some of them were part of. Um, the religious life in Corinth, which included cultic prostitution um, with, uh, within the religious um, practices around some of the temples. The temple of Aphrodite, uh, for instance, um, would involve um, cult prostitution. That was part of their religious practice. And so you have people coming out of this background that was uh, kind of like our culture, hypersexualized. Sex was big. It was um, it was uh, religious. It was a central part of their culture, and so you hear some of that um, coming through in Paul's challenge to the Corinthians, beginning in verse nine, chapter six. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And, and just a sidebar. Um, Paul does not use the phrase kingdom of God um, very often at all in his writings. And when he does, we ought to pay attention because um, this is probably something really significant. And so when he uses this language, will not inherit the kingdom of God, these are some of Paul's strongest words um, for, uh, for the Corinthians. He, he, it's his way of saying, look, re you have to really pay attention now because this is... This is a life and death matter. Inheritance of the kingdom of God is, means it's life and death. Do you not know that wrongdoers will, um, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, so note, he... It, it, this isn't all about sex. This is about greed. This is about fair business practice. This is about a lot of things in life, right? But none of these will inherit the kingdom of God, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything, that's in quotation marks, um, because that's what the Gentiles, that's what the, the Corinthians would say. So Paul is quoting the Corinthians there. You like to say, Paul is saying, you like to say, um, I, can, I have the right to do anything. But not everything is beneficial. You like to say, I will not, uh, um, 
I have the right to do anything, but I, says Paul, will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. In other words, what, what does it matter? What does it matter, what we eat and, and um, what we do to our bodies? The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The Lord loves our bodies. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, bodily. That's what Paul is trying to say. And he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us uh, the wisdom and the patience and the humility of heart um, to hear this word of yours um, for us today, um, that we might honor you with our bodies. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we continue, um, we continue here with our series. Um, for those of you who uh, have not been with us or our guests, we, we're doing this uh, series through Lent that's based upon the Daniel Plan, uh, which is a, a small group series put together by Rick Warren and the folks at Saddleback Church. It's about whole health. It's about, um, it's about following Jesus with all of our lives, body, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, and it's, and it's um, particularly focused, though, on the health of the body. Um, because for many Christians, uh, many Christians like to think, well, I care about my spiritual health, but I, I'm not so worried about or concerned about. I don't often see the connections between my physical health and my life as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so that's why we've been doing this series, and that's the focus of the series. Um, we, we started off by, by recognizing that Jesus, um, the Lord, the triune God, um, has created us just a little lower than the angels. He's created us with dignity, and he indeed loves when he created humankind fully embodied on the sixth day. What did he say? Um, this is very good. He puts the exclamation point on his creation of humankind and all of the rest of the creation when he creates humankind as, um, as people who not just have bodies. Remember, we've said this before. It's not that I have a body and you have a body. We are bodies. I, I am a body, period. I am a body that is... Um, is uh, somehow at once um, body, soul, and spirit, an, an inseparable unity, okay? Um, we've been made with dignity. Uh, we talked about uh, that the word of God is the start of good health. The word of God is better than gold and sweeter than honey, and that's where our health comes from. Um, we talked last week about um, how abundant the Lord's provision is, the enjoyment of food and the abundance um, that we experience in our eating life is part of celebrating and recognizing God's good provision, um, his intention to give his people a land flowing with milk and honey. Abundance is part of God's provision. Abundance without compassion, though, is what? Idolatry. Abundance without compassion is what is, um, is selfishness, is self-centeredness. So um, this week we move on and we're talking about a body fit for the kingdom. A body fit for the kingdom. Now, you know, if you did a, because um, I did this, uh, you know, I did the, the Google search, fit body. 
Now, I, I, uh, so if, if you go and you do that search just be forewarned, it's, it's tantamount to doing a search for soft porn because the images then that come up um, are, are images of scantily clad men and women. And you, you can imagine, you know, fit bodies are only those bodies that have, you know, the, the six packs that are rippling and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, women who are that, um, that one percent shape that the world would like to say is the shape that all women ought to be. You know, it's, so in other words, um, fit body in the way that our world thinks about it is not what we're trying to say in terms of having a fit body. There are different ways of talking about fit, right? The, the ways that we use that word fit. Fit can mean um, in good shape, you know, athletically in good shape. I'm, I'm a fit person. Or fit can mean suitable, um, which may imply good health, but suitable for a purpose. God's given us bodies as um, the dwelling place for his spirit, and that was his purpose from the beginning that the Lord would actually take up his residence in and throughout the creation by dwelling through his spirit inside of people. And, and so he's given us these bodies as the ways that he um, intends to, to be present in the world. Um, a fit body um, has to do with, um, with how we eat, and exercise, activity. You know, and, and I want us to think about that just a little bit here this morning. Um, the connections between our eating habits, um, which we said last week, uh, that's a justice issue. It's not just a, um, oh, I'm concerned about my health. It's a justice issue. Um, but, but what we eat and how we, how we engage our bodies in a healthy, faithful way as disciples of Jesus affects um, our community um, and our life uh, together. A couple of, uh, of statistics, okay? And this comes from that, uh, you know, poor uh, Elizabeth. And um, I remember those uh, tests, the President's Council um, on Fitness Tests. Um, but here are some statistics that come. You can go to the website and check these out. Uh, from the President's Council on Fitness, um, Nutrition and Health. Um, just to give you an idea, less than 5% of adults participate in 30 minutes of activity each day. One in three receive the, only one in three receive the recommended amount of physical activity each week. And it's not a lot of physical, the recommended um, activity each week isn't running a five mile race, okay? That's, that's not what, we are, what we're talking about. 8% uh, of adults and youth fail to meet the aerobic and physical activity level guidelines for good health. Children spend more than seven and a half hours a day in front of a screen. High school students average three hours of video games a day. 90% of Americans eat more sodium than is recommended. Reducing by 1,200 milligrams a day could save up to $20 billion in health costs. Typical American diet exceeds recommended intake levels um, or, or limits in four categories. Calories from solid fats, added sugars, refined grains, um, processed stuff, sodium and saturated fat. Empty calories from added sugars and solid fats contribute 40% total daily calories for 2 to 18 year olds. The number of fast food restaurants has doubled since the 70s. 34% of adults are obese, and that's 07, 08. The, pro the projected number is 50% by 2030, 14 years from now. 17% of children and adolescents are obese. And all of this at an annual health care cost of $190.2 billion. We wonder why we pay so much in health care. And it so, um, you know, my wife warned me. <laughs> Just so you understand, okay, let, let me, here's the caveat. I'm, I am standing up here, a skinny guy, and, you, and you're, some of you are sitting down, they go, well, this is fine for you, Tom. Now, so let me just say, um, I, I do exercise um, on a fairly regular basis, nothing extraneous or um, 
nothing that any of you could do, but that's not why. I'm, I'm skinny because I have good genes, okay? I have, I have a great metabolism, and so I've always been able to eat, and even if I didn't <coughs> exercise, I wouldn't really put on weight. So if I could, if I could, I would love to be able to give you a share of my good metabolism genes. If I could do that, I would do that, but I can't. So as your pastor, I'm simply going to challenge you to, um, to do whatever it's going to take for your body to be healthy. As healthy as you can make it, whatever your age, um, whatever your shape, whatever your condition in life, um, the idea is that God has given us bodies um, to care for. He's given them to us to steward. Um, and, and so as we think about our bodies and the fitness of our bodies, I want us to, to recognize that there are two extremes of body image um, that are prevalent in our culture. We, we read about them there in that first letter to the Corinthians. Um, and it shows up in, um, in the words of the, the writer of Proverbs there, um, in, his, uh, in his wisdom, basic, simple wisdom that he offers. Um, the first option is this. The first option, the fancy word for it, is Gnosticism. Okay? Gnosticism is, is a Greek philosophical um, system that was, um, was religious. Um, Greek philosophical thinking wasn't separated from religion. They were very intimately connected. But Gnosticism said this. Gnosticism said that the body and the material world is evil. And it's all gonna, it's all gonna um, disappear in the end. And the objective, the religious objective in life is to escape the body um, because it's a prison house for um, our soul. Now, does that sound like the way that sometimes we think as Christians? Yes, because Christianity has bought into this pagan Greek way of looking at life from early on in the second century, and it's become part of the Christian tradition, but that's not biblical. It, it is not part of the biblical view of things, um, this view of the body that says it's a throwaway. We can scrap it. I don't care what happens. That's what the Corinthians were saying. Well, the, the food's for the body, and the, or the stomach's for food, um, and food is for the stomach, and it's all going to get destroyed. So who cares? Who cares? Who cares whether my regular... Um, meal is is taken at McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever. Who cares the effects of saturated fats and um, and too much corn syrup and all the stuff that I eat? Um, who cares about it? Because in the end, it's all going to just go away. Um, well, God cares. Let's start there. God cares what we put in our body. God cares what we do with our body. God cares um, how we see our bodies. Um, because our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So Gnosticism is, is, is the one extreme in terms of body image. The other extreme is, this, um, is the other end of the spectrum, and that's the one when you do that Google search for fit body. Um, what you see there is the idolatrous um, preoccupation with a particular body type and a preoccupation with securing my own immortality, as if somehow um, I do have the power to, um, to put off death. Or, or as if somehow I have the power to, um, to be able to avoid the effects of aging. I, I can stay forever young. We can discover the fountain of youth. And, and our culture, um, you know, it, it sells a lot of stuff using this false view of body image. Um, it, a lot of stuff is sold to us on the basis of, if you buy this, you know, the hidden message is if you buy this product or if you do this this way, you can look like this person. Or you can live... Um, this long without having to worry about um, we put uh, we put so much time and energy and effort into um, into this search for immortality that it becomes idolatrous. Those are the two extremes of body image, and and what we um, are challenged to do as followers of Jesus is to figure out um, what is the healthy um, place to understand 
the nature of life in our embodied existence, even in a world um, that is yet to be fully redeemed. And so here are the correctives, and they come from our, our scripture. The biblical corrective, number one, is, is that your body is a temple. Your body is a temple. Why is a, a, a temple is important? Um, the, the metaphor of temple is important is be, it, because um, it, it conveys this idea of the Lord's dwelling place. In, in Israel, for the Jews, the temple was the place where God's holy presence was experienced. The Israelites believed that Yahweh actually dwelt in the Holy of Holies, that place where the high priest went but once a year, and only the high priest, because God's holy presence was not, um, was not to be encountered by your average Jew. And yet Paul now says, look, because of, what Je because of Jesus' sacrifice, and because of Pentecost and the sending forth of the Spirit to all, Every one of us is, uh, is now a temple of the Holy Spirit, and collectively we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Lord dwells by His Spirit in our bodies, and His intention is to reveal Himself through us. So, so we think about, we, we ought to consider um, what I do with my body reflects to the world about me, whether Jesus dwells in me. Do I care for my body in a, in a way that is honoring to the fact that Jesus' spirit dwells within me and wants to be glorified in my body? Biblical corrective number one, um, your body is a temple. Your body is a temple. You know, the, the Proverbs, the, the wisdom of that passage from Proverbs, there's, it's not rocket science, is it? <coughs> You know, and note this, that, um, you know, that the, for the writer of Proverbs, for the biblical view of things, um, um, drinking wine is not the evil. Um, being a drunkard is the evil. Um, enjoying good food is not the evil. Being gluttonous is the evil. And, and the effect of gluttony and, and um, being a drunkard, and I would say... Um, you know, what we, what we need to recognize is that there's a connection between those two patterns in life and slothfulness. You know, that idea that um, you'll be dressed in rags. There's this picture of you become lulled into this um, blob-like state. What was the, what was the movie? Um, the, the cartoon, the, you know, the animated movie, Read Wally? You know, with, with all the people in there in their uh, lazy boy chairs and they never get up and they, you know, are just these blobs that are floating around. You know, that's the effect of, of simply not attending to um, a healthy approach to the ways that I eat and consume things and am active. And they go hand in hand. Our activity level is going to be um, directly affected by what we put in our bodies food-wise. The motivation to exercise is, um, is very directly connected to um, our eating habits. Um, your body is a temple. My body is a temple. We ought to care. Corrective number two is this. And this addresses that other end of the spectrum. Um, we are not after um, the six-pack abs um, and the um, bikini, um, you know, uh, welcoming bodies. Um, what we are after is recognizing the health of our bodies, knowing that there is still a work to be done on our bodies called the resurrection um, that we don't control. Okay? So the corrective number two is that we are awaiting a future glory. We do long for and wait, even as we care for our bodies, and as we care for our bodies even in our old age when we recognize um, that um, some of this is irreversible. Some of this is not about whether I am caring for my body. It's a fact of an aging body. And a body that is subject to um, sin and death. Even as a temple of the Holy Spirit, even as someone who has tasted heavenly things, 
even as someone who has already been seated with Christ in heavenly places, even as someone who has received the Spirit as a down payment, as a guarantee of what is to come, I recognize that until Jesus comes again, this process will be incomplete. And no matter how much money, no matter how much effort, no matter how, no matter how much technology I and we can throw at our aging, we're going to age and we're going to die. From dust we came to dust we shall return. That's how we started the Lenten season. And that's a good reminder. It helps us to, to keep things in perspective. Our body is not a throwaway. But neither is our body something to be idolatrous, uh, um, to, to be um, embraced in an idolatrous, self-absorbed uh, way. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grow inwardly. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for what? For our adoption as sons and daughters for the very redemption of our bodies. Until that day when all things are made new, um, God simply calls us to day-to-day -day faithfulness, um, to care about our bodies in a, in a faithful way, not in a, a, a self-absorbed <coughs> way, um, but to simply care for our bodies. Um, what will you do this week? What little things can you do this week um, to simply say, um, Lord, thank you for the body, you, for this body that you've given me, not the body I wish I had, but for this body you've given me, and I am going to, um, I'm going I'm to care for it the best I can in my day-to-day -day life. How will we honor God in our body? We were bought with a price, and that, that includes our embodied existence. How will we honor the Lord who has purchased us with this, with this very extravagant, um, costly demonstration of love in Jesus Christ? How will we honor him in our bodies? Let's pray together. Lord, for, uh, for wisdom and for understanding, for energy and courage, for determination, we ask that you would provide. We offer up to you our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. And we pray that as you work at transforming our mind and the ways that we think about our lives and our bodies, that you would be glorified in us and through us. We ask that you would do this um, for the sake of your kingdom and for the sake of Christ and his gospel. It's in gratitude that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and join in singing your song of preparation. <clears throat>